We're on with Alan Wellenstein, uh, the, the founder and the leader of Datart Solution Design Practice, which does a lot of work helping clients form their ideas and plans for new systems, new solutions that we then proceed to, to implementing. Hi, Alan. Hello, How are you? Thing. Very well. Uh, bra braving the virus, everyone is safe, I hope. Everyone is safe, and one of the virtues of being the only one in this office is that I still get to go to an office. Well, you know, some of us envy you for, for that. Let's get started. Uh, we, we, we wanted to uh, ask you to explain the, the role of solution design and sort of the value that it brings to client and maybe briefly explain the method that you guys follow and for what type of client situation you, uh, you, you find this most applicable. Sure. So the role of solution design is typically upfront for some of our larger, more complex engagements. And simply put, the, the goal of solution design is to help ensure the success of the project. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to the clients that I interact with, normally it's C-suite and I start with the statistic of 40 to 60% of IT projects failing. Um, and I have yet to be challenged on that statistic. In fact, most of the time, the people I'm speaking to nod sort of knowingly and sadly because it's happened to everyone. Um, IT projects, transformation projects in, particularly, in particular, are incredibly risky. And there's all sorts of reasons why they might fail. Um, some of them are on the technology, but even more of them are on the process program management, alignment across stakeholders, et cetera. So simply put, what we do in solution design is number one, make sure that we crystallize the objective. What is it that we're trying to do? What are the pain points we're trying to alleviate, the opportunities we're going after? Um, and then let's make sure that everyone sees those objectives in the same way. And then let's look at all the things that likely will go bump as part of this process. And I would say it's not about preventing things from going bump. It's not about preventing stuff from blowing up. It's actually acknowledging that they will and trying to get them to blow up as early as possible in the process in as contained a way as possible so that you still have plenty of runway to adapt and course correct and ultimately make sure that the program is a success at the end. I know you often talk about two elements to this, technical engineering and human engineering, which is sound, sound, sounds intriguing. Can you confirm what you mean by that? Maybe so I'll say that some of my UK colleagues have said that human engineering sounds creepy. So I, <laughs> I sometimes say human or program management. But yes, the, the, when, when we think about risks on projects, we think about them from those two dimensions. So technical risks tend to be assumptions being wrong about what you might be able to do, either you know this tool out there is going to give us the functionality we need and work the way we want it to work, or this uh, API is going to be performant enough. And it's those kinds of assumptions that if you get wrong and you discover too late, can torpedo your project. And then on the human engineering side of the equation, it's misalignments across stakeholders. So typically in some of the larger transformations that we do, it's across, um, it's across departments, across uh, stakeholders within a company. And if you get that uh, alignment wrong, if this group and this group don't see the universe in the same way and you discover it too late, it's a, one of the main reasons why so many projects fail. And so we make sure that not only are we at the beginning understanding the objectives, which by the way, sometimes involves a healthy amount of reverse engineering requirements into objectives. We'll often hear, oh, we need to replace our CRM with something that's better. Okay, great. Replace the CRM is a requirement, but let's unpack why are we replacing the CRM in that instance? What are we trying to do, et cetera? And then let's make sure that all the people across the company who that is going to affect uh, are on board and aware of this transformation and that you take their input needs, concerns, risks into consideration as early as possible so that you don't reach a situation where you're 60% of the way in and you discover you got something wrong, but by then it's too expensive to course correct. Yeah, I imagine the, this sort of work is best done when you're all physically in the same space, which is not the luxury we can all afford in times like this. But I'm sure you, you have advice and tips and tricks and some observations on how it can be done in this new virtual world we're all inhabiting right now. Can you share your observations the last few weeks? What, what, what uh, has your work been like and how do you see it evolving going forward? So 
I actually don't know how critical it is for everyone to be in the same room. It's it's useful, I think, for getting to know people. Honestly, when I do on-sites, I get more value out of the sort of dinner and drinks afterwards, getting to know people with their guard down and hearing about them from a different perspective other than the work. That, of course, is helpful at the beginning of a project. But in terms of the actual doing of a, of a project, so in solution design, we do a tremendous amount of prototyping and building proofs of concept and iterating. It's a very iterative process. And one of the problems of on-site, especially when you have people traveling, is that you try to get everything done in that one week or two weeks when everyone is there. And that in and of itself can sometimes be a problem because it doesn't lend itself to the what would otherwise be iterative process. So one of the things that I've actually found quite sort of a benefit, if you will, of the work from home is that we are able to democratize the participation in these meetings. Remote participants and on-site participants have equal footing, equal square footage, if you will, in the Zoom grid. And we're able to actually get more time from the people we interact with because we're able to do it an hour here, an hour there over several weeks. And when we iterate and we show them our prototypes, we're actually able to meaningfully show them the result of the last conversation. Whereas when we do this on-site and everything is one week, you miss this opportunity to, like I said, get more time with all of the stakeholders who we typically want to talk with, and then to show them the fruits of the iteration process of taking some ideas, thinking about it, going to our UX experts or our technical experts, trying something, and then coming back with what we've learned and adjusting together. Mm. I know you've recently completed a very large and mission critical solution design effort for a large client in retail, which was interesting because it started uh, when everyone could meet in person and ended well into this quarantine time. So it's a perhaps a unique project that started one way and finished the other, or, or was it? How did your experience change over the course of that one effort? Well, the client's priorities shifted there in retail, as you mentioned, and um, what was important before uh, quarantine and what was important after quarantine shifted in a meaningful way. And one of the nice things about the solution design methodology, because it is iterative and agile, it wasn't an issue with us. So some of their priorities changed, but it was not an issue to our program and helping them figure out how we were going to sort of optimize the solution given the current state and, and their requirements, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the mechanics, um, it really was, like I mentioned a minute ago, um, much more effective in terms of the number of people who we needed to interact with and the time that we got with them, especially given that they were super, super busy. I mean, they're one of the few industries who their problem is keeping up with demand. These people were incredibly busy, but because we were doing it remotely, we were able to still get time when people could fit it into their schedule and iterate with them and show them, like I said, the fruits of our prototyping process. So I actually think it in this particular case, it did not hurt the process at all. Excellent. Thanks very much, Alan. <laughs>